Father, we thank you that you've given us the chance to study your word. For in your word is life. The apostles rightly said, you have the words of life, where else can we go? And Father, for this weak and foolish man that preaches your word, please take me far out of the way. And may each person that's here hear your voice. May they hear your voice, God, not mine. As, um, as John the Baptist said, I stand in mighty company when I say, please, Lord, let me decrease that you might increase. Have your way. Teach us your word and change our lives thereby. We are in desperate and dire need of it, God. We don't claim anything else but your word upon our life now. Holy Spirit, we invite you to have your way for a, a rhema word for some, for correction and instruction, for reproof. God, help us. We need you desperately and terribly do we need you. In Christ Jesus and for the glory of his kingdom alone, these things we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> 15th of Judges, 15th chapter, book of Judges. Go back to the 14th chapter, just pick it up in verse 18. So the men of the city said to him on the seventh day before the sun went down, What is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? And he said to them, If you had not plowed with my heifer, you would have not solved my riddle. Everybody remember that from last week? Samson poses riddle to his guests and they pressured his betrothed wife and she told him the answer and that was the end of it. They cheated and he had to go and because uh, he was gambling. Everybody remember Samson? The Nazarite and the things he had promised and the terrible waste of talent that is Samson's life. I almost don't want to read this next chapter. It's so bad what happens to this dude. Look at verse 19 again of, of 14th chapter. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily, and he went down to Ashkelon and killed 30 of their men, took their clothes, gave the change of clothing to those who had explained the riddle. So his anger was aroused, and he went back to his father's house, and Samson's wife was given to his companion, who had been the best man. Let me give you a picture here. Samson's getting married. He throws this glorious party, invites some friends, invites some of uh, his wife's friends, and he gambles with them. I don't know if you've ever gambled with somebody who is your friend, and immediately you lose them as a friend. And if you gamble with somebody who's not your friend, immediately they hate your guts, and you hate them, especially if they solve your riddle or beat you in cards or whatever it is that you've done. So what does Samson do? Well, he kind of mans up a little bit, and he goes and kills a bunch of people and takes their clothes. <laughs> Why does it say he forged an army? Why does it this leader of men, this mighty man of God, why does it not say? If there is one running theme through the first, for 12, through the, the last two, three chapters, the next chapter, why is it not this man was a great leader? Do you understand that he had the ability to be one of the greatest leaders of Jewish history? Samson, Samson's name could have gone down as David's name. It could have gone down as Joseph's name. It could have gone down as one of the greatest... Man, that was a servant of God. But it doesn't. It doesn't at all. And it is so sad. And if we are not finding the ability to put ourselves in Samson's very sandals, Or, if we are not finding ourselves with the ability to put ourselves in Samson's parents' shoes. Listen, it's so typical, and I've seen it a hundred times. So he loses the bet, and he stomps off all upset from his own party. There he goes, then fine! And it's, see what it says in the last line there? And Samson <clears throat> went back to his father's house. Could you see his, his betrothed wife? He hadn't even consummated the marriage yet. The wedding feast was barely over. Father-in-law is like, where'd Samson go? 
he, he got mad and stomped off. Samson got mad. Oh, Samson's got mad. Now, I thank God that, could you imagine if a spoiled brat kid that really had those kind of gifts got mad and like bam bammed your house? Can we watch the Flintstones? Bam, 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 bam. He smashes everything. What happened? Bam Bam got mad. But I'll say to you this, and I don't mean this in jest, that Barney and his wife were better parents. And I ask you, young people, to ask yourselves, the Bible says that if your parents don't spank you, they don't love you. Because despite what they feel, you all deserve, every once in a while, a good whopping. Even Arlie, every once in a while, deserves a good whopping. So after a while, in the time of the wheat harvest, it happened that Samson visited his wife with a young goat. And he said, let me go in to my wife, into her room, but her father would not permit him to go in. Her father said, I really thought that you thoroughly hated her. Therefore, I gave her to your companion. Is not her younger sister better than she? Please, take her instead. He comes back a few months later and says, um, can I have my wife now? And the guy's like, serious? Well, when she told the riddle, I thought like you were like really mad. I mean, you did go kill 30 people. Then you didn't come back. You went to your father's house and your best man stepped in for you. And he's kind of like married to your wife now. And I find this so typical of modern youth who have no ability to communicate. Their ability to communicate is gone. Listen, I want you to understand this. And I mean not to put anybody here down. I really don't. But our youth are so accustomed to texting, emailing, and whatever else they do these days, that the ability to communicate one-on-one -on -one verbally with looking somebody in the eye, the ability to communicate is gone. Kids come into my store almost every day. You hiring? Oh, I can't wait to hire you. <laughs> yeah, I'm hiring. You, would you like an application? Yeah. <laughs> Do you have a pen? Don't you have a pen? <laughs> <laughs> Here's the application. Or it's their mom or dad that comes in with them. Hey, uh, my son needs a job. Uh, would you uh, hire him? Sure. I, you know, we're always looking for you know a grunt, a laborer, somebody we can yell at and beat up. Good, good. How old's your son? 23. <laughs> your son is 23 and you're asking for a job for him? And then you meet this kid and they are so awkward to talk to you face to face because they've been on the computer communicating via, again, text, email, um, I am, whatever it is, they cannot look at you. The ability for them to communicate is all but gone. And the foundation that is set for them, I heard a pastor this week on, um, actually it was that Ben Carson guy. That, uh, that guy was a doctor. You, you guys know what I'm talking about? Does anybody know? Black dude from, I want to say, is he from Chicago? guy who's been a doctor, a pediatric surgeon for like 20 some odd years and I think he's going to get into uh, uh, politics now and he talked about the science of <clears throat> imprint on a youth mind, on a young mind, that they're searching for their identity, that from the time they're three to some eight, nine, ten, they're looking for an identity. And because parents are so busy, they do not identify with their parents. They don't look, kids don't look like their parents anymore. So what they surround themselves is what they begin to look like and act like. So that's why you'll see some white kid from Boca who talks like some ghetto kid from Chicago. Yo, what's up, dog? And, all this. and then you meet their parents and they're like, hey, how are you? It's nice to meet you. 
<laughs> and you're like, wow, Eminem raised your kid. That's impressive. <laughs> That's because they were searching for identity. Their little heart, their little mind, their, their soul was looking to identify with somebody. And he found no strength in his father, no strength in his mother. And whatever is there, whatever he found strength in. You know what they tell me at the gym? It's so funny. Your son walks like you. Your son talks like you. Your son does jujitsu like you. He better. It's not like I ain't spent enough time with him. Guys at the gym are jealous of my children. Man, your kids are so good. I tell them all the time. It ain't a secret. That whole quality time excuse. Well, I don't spend a lot of time, but I spend quality time. Like, dude, that is not what your kid needs. Quality time is BS. What you need is time and lots of it. Lots of it. When your kid is acting, listen, hasn't happened in a while, thank God, because maybe <clears throat> the church situation we have now. But do you know when I was over at the other church and I was doing biblical counseling, we had people, ladies and men come into our place and, and when they were being brutally honest, they'd say, I can't stand my kid. It's the most terrible thing in the world. And I said, what, what do you mean? I don't like my son. I don't like my daughter. They've turned into somebody else. And I said, well, tell me about your life, you know, and you find out that she works a full-time job, he works a full-time job, the kid's in daycare for the first six hours, aftercare for the last two hours, and, and, and the kid is adopting the personality, not just of the people that are taking care of him or her, but also the ability of mob rules. You guys understand the, the situation of mob rules? You have a bunch of kids, and you, did anybody not see Lord of the Flies? You gotta see the movie Lord of the Flies. A new one came out a couple years ago. It's what happens. These kids are always around themselves. And, and who, they, for instance, this is just a small aspect of it. How many of you have a, I have one son and five daughters. My son has learned how to be a young gentleman. I mean, you ask his sisters, they wouldn't say that. He's so rough. And, but if you see a daughter who has multiple brothers, you think to yourself, man, this kid is, tch, she's brute. <laughs> What'd you say? <laughs> Dude, you didn't just say that, did you? <laughs> wow. And that's the imprint that's left. That's, that's the ability to... to so teach your child that communication is not L-O-L or R-O-L-F, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's teaching them. You, has, have any of you ever met my daughters? I have my four-year-old and my five-year-old, she's gonna be six soon, so I got basically a four and six-year-old, and you walk up to them and I tell them, this is my friend, I want you to look at them in the eye, shake their hand and say, hi, it's nice to meet you. You, I introduce my daughter and she'll look you right in the eye and she'll go, Hi, it's nice to meet you. Ashlyn, when she was nine or ten years old, she's homeschooled basically her whole life. She'd, we'd go to a party from people at church and all their kids would be in Christian school. Or she'd walk right into the middle of the group and she'd say, Hi, my name's Ashlyn. <laughs> They'd laugh at her. <laughs> oh, she didn't understand the rules. She didn't understand the rules. You have to find your pecking order place. She didn't understand that. She was just being an adult. I say this to you, parents with young children. Get these kids off those you-know-what computers, cell phones. Make them communicate. For the world that always puts down us as homeschoolers for the last 15 years, the world always asks the same thing. Well, how did it get socialization? How did it get socialization? Listen to me. No joke, at this point in time, the kid goes to school and he's around mob rules, comes home, gets right on a computer. How does your kid get socialization? 
R-O-L-F, L-O-L, uh, F-Y-I. Uh, <laughs> I don't know them all. <clears throat> O-T-W. And then you can't, uh, you can't communicate with the kids. Now let me tell you, this is, this is where Samson's at. And I'll tell you why I, m I meant this whole story. Samson, let me tell you what happened with Samson. Samson, who knows, maybe he's in his 20s at this point in time, but listen to me. Samson left without looking at his father alone and said, listen, I'm really PO'd, I'll be back in a little while. He didn't. They should know the way I think. Your kids do that. Your kids stomp their feet. <laughs> you know what they want and you're going to give it to them. You're not going to make them say, I'm sorry. You're not going to make them do anything. I want you to apologize. I'm not going to apologize. Then you ain't going to eat tonight. What? You don't feed your kid? Yeah, that's right. I don't feed them. Any of my kids look like they're starving? Tell my wife. I get mad at my wife all the time. Don't you dare make three different meals. You make one meal. If they don't want to eat it, that's fine. Well, we're going to stop at McDonald's because he likes McDonald's. We're going to go to Pollo Tropical because they like Pollo Tropical. Listen, if I'm going and Pollo's here and Chipotle's there, okay. But don't ask my wife to make four. You understand what I'm saying? This is what you had. This is the prototypical. This is the spoiled is brat attitude in the entire world. You should have known what I wanted. My parents always know what I want and they always give me what I want. Well, you shouldn't have left your wife in the arms of another man, fool. You with me? Do you see it? After a while, in the time of the wheat harvest, it happened that Samson visited his wife with a young goat and he said, let me go into my wife, into her room. I didn't consummate the marriage. His father wouldn't permit him to go in. His father said, but I really thought you thoroughly hated her. I mean, who leaves for three months and comes back? By the way, well, you should have known. Here's this guy, and I'm telling you, this is Bam Bam. He's a kid with, with, with superhuman strength. Therefore, I gave her to a companion. Is not her younger sister better than she? Please take her and send. Samson said, This time I shall be blameless regarding the Philistines if I harm them. Then Samson went, caught 300 foxes. He took torches, turned the foxes tail to tail, put a torch between each pair of tails, and when he had set the torches on fire, he let the foxes go into the standing grain of the Philistines and burnt up both the shocks and the standing grain as well as the vineyards and the olive groves. Please give me your attention. This dude's dangerous, man. Now, just so you know, that word for foxes there, in the Hebrew, the better translation um, would be um, jackal. jackal. Thank you. I told them before and I forgot. So he took these jackals, apparently, and now the, also the way that he collected them, the implication from the original language that he trapped them. So he had these traps, apparently, I don't know if he used the pelts, or got the traps, maybe he got his men, and he got these things, and he took their tails, and he tied a rope, and set it on fire. So they run, he lets them go, and he just lets them keep going into all their fields. And they run back and forth, obviously, they had towed by the tail until, who knows, and Manny was worried that the foxes would die, maybe the rope when it got down to the bottom, broke, and then they went their own way. So maybe, maybe no jackals were actually killed in the making of this story. Who knows? <laughs> maybe they died. Maybe, I don't know, who knows? We could ask God when we get there, though, right? And you can walk up to Samson and say, you know, you stink. <laughs> and I love this because here it is. Has anybody ever had a son? who has gone through the court system, or daughter who's gone through the drug rehab system. Do you notice they don't care who they hurt when they throw their fits? Do you notice that? I wouldn't mind so much if they threw your fit if it was you that paid. But for me, it was my parents all the time. 17 years old, got a fight in school. Cop came, pushed him, arrested me. There I am, first time ever going to jail. 16 and a half years old. Got out. Guess who hired the lawyer? My father. Guess who had to take me to court? My father. I can tell you how many times that happened. Anybody have that experience? Anybody? You? I was joking. I was just kidding. 
ridiculous. And here he is, now he throws his fit, and now this time I shall be blameless, because you weren't blameless before, right? Nothing's his fault. Another sign. Well, you made me mad. Your kid ever say that? You made me mad. My dick a fuss right on me. You made me hit you. You made me. You made me. It's not my fault. It's her fault. You shouldn't have. We didn't. That that. Blame, 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 blame. There he is again. Spoiled, rotten, brat, kid. It's not my fault. Somebody else's fault. Boy, this is a warning for all us parents. Let me tell you, I don't care how good your kids are. I got the, I'm telling you, nobody could have better kids than me. It can't happen. You still got to be on them. Night and day, day and night. I mean, for the age that my kids are at and, and the blessings that my kids have been, you got to stay on top of them. Even the best of kids. Burnt up the village. And the Philistines said, verse 6, Who has done this? And they answered, Samson, the son-in-law of the Timnite, because he has taken his wife and given to her his companion. And I love the whole idea that, like, boy, the story got around quick, didn't it? Gossip, man. So Philistines came up and burnt her and her father with fire. Remember we talked about that a couple of chapters ago? That was kind of like a Philistine way. Remember we talked about it last week? No police. Who are you going to call? Better keep yourself protected. No police. Can you see them? On the phone? Who knows how they had communication back then? Fold up a letter, put it on a pigeon, throw this. Who knows? So what did they do? Philistine said, oh, they burnt up. I mean, who knows how many acres of food that this guy burnt up with these jackals. They said, okay, no problem. We found out who did it. So they went down to his wife, they went down to her father, and they burnt them with fire. This is not a good guy. He really isn't. You can't, you can't even paint him as a good guy. Somebody else's fault, though. I didn't... I, I, they shouldn't have given my wife away and made me mad. How many of you guys have spackle in your house for the holes in the wall that your kids keep punching? Your kids punching holes in the walls already? No. <laughs> I'm just joking. You didn't have to answer that. And they answered Samson, the son-in-law of the Timnite, because he has taken his wife and given her to his companion. So the Philistines came up, burnt her and her father with fire. Samson said to them, since you would do a thing like this, I will surely take revenge on you, and after that I will cease. Ready? Sign number 18 of the spoiled brat kid. Whatever they do is okay. Whatever somebody else does, how could you do that? How could you do that? You just did the... Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what they do. You can't do nothing. In my, in my house we call that sensitive, sensitively insensitive. You talked about my mother. Like, dude, you've been cussing me one... You, know, you understand? Does anybody... Like, I was a kid like that. I could say any nasty thing to you, horrible, as soon as you said something to me. How dare you? Nobody talks to me like that. I'm special. My mommy's always told me I'm special. Your mommy should have washed her mouth. I was so once in a while then. Since you would do such a thing like this, I will surely take revenge on you, and after that I will cease. So he attacked them hip and thigh with a great slaughter, and he went down and dwelt in the cleft of the rock at Edom. Give me your attention, please. He says, uh, since you do something like this, then I'm going to take vengeance on you, and then I'll stop. <laughs> even his, his whole verbiage, you hear him? Just even talks like a little brat. I wonder the text, I will T-A, you know. <laughs> says that he attacked him hip and thigh. Hip and thigh. That's an old Edom for, uh, it was an, actually an old sports Edom. Uh, it's basically like saying opened up a can of whoop butt on him. It's really, it's an, it's an idiom, not an idiom, an idiom. It's 
just like a saying, oh, he attacked him hip and thigh. He opened up a can on you know, You understand what I'm saying? Remember I said, the, the writer who, who when Sam, Samuel, or whoever it is that wrote Judges, wrote this, he really, the language was just, the language of the day is so much that he put in that gave us a, a hint of what was going on in that day and age. Really good stuff if you're into the verbiage of the day. Verse 9, Now the Philistines went up and camped in Judah and deployed themselves against Lehi. And the men of Judah said, Why have you come up against us? So they answered, We have come up to arrest Samson to do to him as he has done to us. Give me your attention. Listen, Israel was in a state of oppression. Israel was being run, ruled, and reigned over by the Philistines. Now here's this great man. They could not find a way to gather themselves together to fight against the Philistines. They were afraid of the Philistines. Instead of this man with all his power and all his talent and all these gifts forging an army to fight against the Philistines. Do you see the sad thing that's happening here? Oh, they forged an army, all right. Hey, um, what are you guys doing here? We're here to get Samson. We'll get him for you. So they forge an army. Look. 3,000 men of Judah went down to the cleft of the rock of Edom and said to Samson, do you not know that the Philistines rule over us? What is this that you've done to us? 3,000 men fought against the Philistines, a great slaughter, and they won their freedom. No. It's not what it says. The people of God are oppressed. What a picture of the people of... The power of God lives upon you. The Bible says that the same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. You have this power. You have this ability. You have this strength that is in your very spirit. What is it that is your struggle that you cannot overcome? Tell me. Is it herb? Is it cigarettes? Is it psychotropic meds? I mean, what is it? Is it depression? Is it alcohol? What is it that holds you down? Violence? Uh, sexuality? What is it? This is... The people of God are being oppressed. And they say they don't have the power. And I tell you right now, God wants to give you power. You say to that mountain, be thou removed and be cast into the sea and it will be done to you. Done for you. Well, it's easy for you to say. No, it's not. It's hard for me to say. It's easy for me to preach because I'm an overcomer. Because I'm willing to sacrifice. God's given you the power. He's given you the sacrifice. Now it's your turn to sacrifice. It's our turn to sacrifice. It's better to pluck out your eye, to cut off your hand, than to go into hell with two good eyes and two good hands. Get serious. If you're struggling, if not, hey. You know, for, our, for the sake of our discussion, you know, it's like some of us have made our children our idols. And God's like, I'll give you power out of that. I'll help you. So 3,000 Israelites, they go to Samson, and they say, what's the matter with you? Don't you understand? We are in... <laughs> I don't understand. I, I, I hope you guys see what's happening here. The nation of Israel was the strongest nation on the face of the earth. Their God had delivered them from the Egyptians. He had split the Red Sea. They walked through on dry ground. They screamed and the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. Just a hundred years before this, God had done things on the face of the planet that never have happened ever. The whole world shuddered at the name of Yahweh. Yahweh. That's their God. 
When you see the word Lord, the Lord, they spoke of the Lord. That's the word Yahweh. It was breathed. The word Yahweh, some people pronounce it Jehovah. But that's a, that's a, um, that's a, um, an incorrect spelling and, and pronunciation. The word, because in the Hebrew they don't have vowels, is W H uh, Y H W H, Yahweh. Yahweh. Don't you know that the Philistines rule over Yahweh? Are you kidding me? It's sad when a people when a people are defeated and they know it. It's a very sad, very sad thing that's happened here. But they said to him, We have come to arrest you, that we may deliver you into the hand of the Philistines. Then Samson said, Swear to me that you will not kill me yourselves. So they spoke to him, saying, No, but we will tie you securely and deliver you into their hand. But we will surely not kill you. And they bound him, excuse me, with new ropes, and brought him up from the rock. When he came to Lehi, the Philistines came shouting against him. When he came to Lehi, the Philistines, here they come, right? And they're pushing him. He's all tied up. Can you see the scene? They're pushing him down the rock. And there he is, all tied up. Who knows, hands and feet, how? Brand new ropes. And there he comes. And all the Philistines, they gather around. There he is. He's the one that burned up our grain. There he is. He's the one that killed. He's the one that's been responsible for all the troubles. There he is. And they all surround him and they start to mock him. Maybe they're spitting on him. Maybe they're calling him names. Maybe they're starting to get a rope and they're about to lynch him. Who knows what they're going to do. But look what happens. <clears throat> when, the, when he came to Lehi, the Philistines came shouting against him. Then the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. And the ropes that were on his arms became like flax that is burned with fire. And his bonds broke loose from his hands, and he found a fresh jawbone of a donkey, reached out his hand and took it, and killed a thousand men with it. Now you see that word for fresh? Better translation is damp or wet. That means that it was still, it wasn't some brittly old bone. It was fresh. It was, it was like still had moistness in it and he picks it up, he breaks it and he picks it up and just he just starts ta -da 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 -da, going to town ba -ba -ba, shoo, boom killed a thousand men now I love this thing here he says that the spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily and the ropes that were on his arms became like flax that is burned with fire listen to me have you ever been in church and made this commitment to God. You come to church and it's during, it's usually for me, it's during worship. And something about the song that just lifts my heart up to God and I feel for a second I'm just completely satisfied. I'm completely one with God. And I just make, the, God, I'm never going to do that again. That's it. I'm telling you. The Spirit of the Lord comes upon me mightily. And just for a while my bonds are broken. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Yes, it's the sweetest thing in the world. It really is. And for a moment, your bonds are broken. For a moment. Then Samson said, With the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey, I have slain a thousand men. Now in Hebrew, it rhymes. <laughs> in English, it doesn't rhyme. There's been some men that have translated the little poem. It's a little haiku poem. And they translated it and, and made it rhyme. In, in the Greek, I mean in the Hebrew, uh, heaps and donkey have a, a, a similar sound to them. So it's like, with the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, I've piled up the men high and steeps, you know, something like that. I should have planned that out before I said this. He writes a poem about his great slaughter. Last thing about spoiled brat kids. Because our society tells them so. They believe everything is a TV show that they're the star of. Life is about them. 
They have their Facebook page, they have their MySpace page, they have their Twitter, they have their Instagram, they have everything. And when you talk to them, they make faces like there's a camera angle everywhere. Where's my camera? Now, not every kid that does that's bad. I don't want you to get me wrong. It's just, it's another aspect of the kids that we have in our society. Life is just all about them. All about them. Every aspect of it. And who they hurt on the way there, and who's been hurt on the way there, is inconsequential. <laughs> what they post on their Instagram, MySpace, or whatever else they post it, and who they hurt when they do it, who they talk ill or evil of. If you've never seen that movie, um, um, the Social Network, there's a line in that movie. The woman looks at the, the guy and he says, you know, he says, the internet is written in pen, not pencil. What you put up there, it's there forever. You can't take it back. And I think that's one of the things that our, we don't teach our children. You know, I've tried to drill into my children's brain their whole lives that at 13 years old, you're an adult. And the decisions you make at 13 affect the rest of your life. You're not a kid anymore. 13. Everything you say, everything you do from here on out will either help or hurt your future. You follow me? I'm going to write a poem. I did so great. I did so great. I I'm going to write a poem. With the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps. With the jawbone of a donkey, I have slain a thousand men. Oh, you did, did you? See, I thought it said that the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon you. And God gave you a great slaughter to kill God's people. It's a shame that Samson has chosen to be a vessel of dishonor. I heard a old-time writer, I don't remember who wrote it, he said, anybody can bring glory to God because no life is beyond... Oh, how did he use it? Remember I said a couple months ago? A couple weeks ago. It's like any, any life... There's no such thing as a wasted life in God's economy because anybody could be... Ow. Listen. Forget it. I'll, I'll, if I remember, I'll send you a piece of paper or something that says it. I'll, I'll text it to you or something. <laughs> Basically, it says that even, even a bad example can be an example of how mighty God is. You could be a vessel of honor, a vessel of dishonor. Here's a man who's obviously a vessel of dishonor, right? But boy, is he bringing glory to what God's Spirit can do. And so it was when he had finished speaking that he threw the jawbone from his hand and called that place Ramath Lehi, which means jawbone heights. Then he became very thirsty, so he cried out to the Lord and said, You have given this great deliverance by the hand of your servant, and now shall I die of thirst and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised? Am I the only one that sees this spoiled brat non-stop? Non-stop. I'm thirsty. I'm hungry. Where's my wife? Hey, uh, Samson, that's a dead carcass of a lion. You're not supposed to go near dead things. Keep your hand out of there. I'm hungry. And he brought it home for his mom and dad. And didn't tell them where he got it from. Mom, I saw a woman down at the Tim Knights. Get her from me as a wife. What's the matter? Can't you find somebody among your own people? Don't marry a non-believer. I want her. She pleases me. I gotta have it now. I'm thirsty. God, if you love me. Oh, listen, I wish there was a better message. I wish I can. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, guys. I've been reading this thing for like four weeks now, trying to come up with a better way to, to present this to you. But there is no better way. There is nothing else. This guy is... Now, here's the thing, guys. And I want to reiterate this. You can do everything right, and your kids could still turn out wrong. 
this is not a total indictment upon his parents because you could do all the things right and again I've said this before and I've said this probably a hundred times since I've been preaching because one of the things that stuck out in my mind as good as anything else ever did with my pastor pastor Bob one time he said so if you can do everything right and things could still turn out bad for your kids then why do it and the answer is because you're writing your book they have to write their book you're writing your book and the chapter that has your kids in it has got to say did all he did all she could do you want to stand before God and say God hey look I wasn't a perfect parent but I tell you I tried and God's gonna say I, you know, and I, I don't even put this crazy conjecture, but since there's no tears in heaven, somehow the memory of all that just is erased. I, I don't know how that works out. And the glory of heaven is so pales the misery of earth. And you guys down here, you young folk, if I'm saying some stuff to you guys that is like, wow, that sounds like me, you have the chance to get out of it. You're not stuck being Samson. I mean, hey, Samson was cool. He was strong. <laughs> he was the weakest man ever lived. All that strength. Then he became very thirsty, and he cried out to the Lord and said, You have given this great deliverance by the hand of your servant, and now shall I die of thirst and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised. So God split the hollow place that is in Lehi, and water came out, and he drank, and his spirit returned, and he revived. Then he called its name En Hakori, which means spring caller or the caller of the spring, bringing more glory to his own name. Not God gives, God delivers, God's water, nothing. Nothing. I come from a Christian home. You should act like it, dude. Which is in Lehi to this day. And he judged Israel 20 years in the days of the Philistines. Now, I wish that that was the last line of Samson's life and he judged Israel 20 years I wish we could say look he was a pretty much the leader of Israel for 20 years everybody looked to him it gets worse it gets much worse and we're gonna have to do that next week I, I, I thought of a way to maybe do both chapters today but it's just impossible to do that we're gonna have to look um, next week at Samson and Delilah most famous story of all that everybody knows about Samson and Delilah and at, by the end of the next chapter, you're going to be like... <laughs> In Italian, we have a word. It's called struts. What are struts? <laughs> right? If you look up struts in an Italian dictionary, there's a picture of Samson. <laughs> they have something like that in... What is it? No, it's stupid. Is it stupid? Stunad? Struts. What are struts? Huh? You got one too? This year I thought that saying stupid, that is a cheat. Statisich? That is a cheat. That's what I was told. That means shut up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In Italian, statisich is like, you shut your mouth. <laughs> yeah. But I heard that one a lot too. Don't worry. <laughs> shh, shh, shh. It's not nice. Guys, it's never too late. And like I said on, on a Sunday and in, on Wednesday of last week, it's never too late to move forward. The greatest thing about the kingdom of God and serving God is if you failed your children yesterday, you don't have to fail them tomorrow. That's an awesome thing. It's an awesome thing, a great chance God has given us. Because when your life is a complete mess, in the kingdom of the world, you're called a loser. In the kingdom of God, it's called a great testimony. It's never too late, parents. It's never too late, children. Never. It's never. In God's economy, He could turn everything around. Remember, God is sovereign. Sovereign. It was Chuck Missler who put it this way. God knows the end from the beginning. And let's say your life is a, a parade. God's in a helicopter looking down at the parade that is your life. 
And he has the ability to change anything he wants at any time he wants because he's outside of time. Keep in mind that. He's outside of time. God is not restricted by our time. What was yesterday to God is still the present. What's, I mean, what's yesterday to us is still in God's present. What's tomorrow to us is still in God's present. God could change it. He could change past, present, future. He's awesome like that. Take these warnings that we have in the form of Samson and, and his parents and move forward on them. And if you need help, we're here to help. We got a lot of good parents who have multiple kids here, and we'll help you. We'll help you. And if it's something as simple as, as behavioral issues, or something as horrible as drug and alcohol and crack and prostitution when dr your kid's dancing in a club, you know, whatever it is, we'll help you. We'll help you. Prayer is the absolute most powerful weapon you have against the enemy. More than your words, prayer is atomic. Atomic. I hope you have hope. I pray you have hope after what we just learned. But I also pray you have your warning. The Bible talks about the watchman on the wall. You have your warning now. We have our warning. We, all of us. I am not the perfect parent, nor is my wife. We have our struggles too. And we are continually looking to move forward in success. Amen? Let's pray together. Uh, Father, we thank you that you've given us your word. And I do pray, Lord Jesus, that your word has gone forth in a manner that convicts those that need change, God. That consoles those who need hope, God. And, and for the young'uns and the young folk and the, those that have seen themselves a little too much, God, that their, their anger and their angst is not directed toward you, nor toward me, nor toward their parents, God, but they maybe for the first time take personal responsibility and say, the Spirit of the Lord shall come upon me mightily, and my chains shall be broken. God, that's my prayer for every single person in here, including myself, God, that the Spirit of the Lord would come mightily upon us and our bonds would be broken. The Spirit of the Lord would come mightily upon us and our bonds will be broken. God, your word tells us in Luke 11 that you give your Holy Spirit to those that ask. Please, God, may your spirit fall upon us mightily and our bonds broken. We need you, Holy Spirit, to repair and to restore, to instruct and to guide, to lead us into all truth, to instruct us in the way that we should go. Before I say amen, um, Drew, would you come up and uh, play a song, please? I just feel like this is a little time of worship that we need before we leave. We have some extra time. I, I ended early. Just a time to, to take the conviction or the encouragement that God's given us tonight and, and to just worship God about it. Let the Spirit of the Lord come upon you mightily and your bonds be broken. Whether that is through the power of prayer for your child or yourself or whether it's you're here and you looked at Samson and you went, that's me. I'm 20-something, I'm 30-something and I'm still a spoiled brat. And you want the Spirit of the Lord to come upon you mightily and to break your bonds.